Hello and welcome back to week number five. So in session four, you were supposed to ask somebody three reasons why they love you. And hopefully that was a helpful experiment emotionally and that you can see that there's people there cheering for you. There's people there that's on your side and care about you and wanna see you recover from this. Um, also, hopefully you're doing good starting to target those negative thoughts and catching them, creating the better but believable thoughts. You know, probably lots of practice you had with all the different high expectations um, you had last time. And also if there was somebody you needed to ask for forgiveness uh, because of your expectations you were piling on them, hopefully that was productive as well. Um, so, so in session five, we're gonna look at diet and exercise. And it, it's unbelievable like how important this area is in anxiety and depression. And you know, it's one of the easiest things to change. Um, you know, just buying the right foods, getting up off of the couch and following some of the things that we're gonna talk about. But our, our skill, just to make it super simple, is on exercise. Uh, so we'll take it over to the other video and I will see you back here in just a minute. Hello and welcome back. Uh, so ho hopefully you're kind of evaluating your expectations and not doing, not doing the shooting all over yourself and you know just having a healthy balance of you know what's really important in life and uh, so this week um, we will be talking about diet and exercise and really the the skill is just to begin the exercise and you, you know right now people spend 30 billion a year on different vitamins and supplements and you know, if you could take all the benefits of exercise and put it in a pill, you know, I'd be a multi-billionaire because it would by far outweigh any supplement, any vitamin that you could possibly take. Um, I mean, I'm not even going to go through the list and list of benefits for that. And here's the thing, I, you know, I don't want you to become a marathon runner tomorrow, right? So we're going to start somewhere. And if that means getting up and walking around the block, once a day for this week because you haven't done that in years go for it you know if you're, if you're used to exercising maybe who, maybe you're a personal trainer you exercise every day and, and you know th this is a skill you've already got and you know maybe you don't find much benefit from it and, and you know at every skill again every person is unique anxiety and depression stems from different places so some of these skills you're going to say this works great for me i love it i'm going to use it the rest of my life and others are going to say, you know what, this has not helped me at all. But for this one, there's so many benefits to it. it I'd be hard pressed to find somebody who says, you know what, exercise doesn't do anything for me. But here's what I will say. When your anxiety is high and you exercise, you're probably going to feel 10 times worse. Like the last thing you want to do when depression's hitting heavy, anxiety's hitting heavy, is to go out on a bike ride or go out on a little jog, whatever it may be. And chances are like you'll feel absolutely horrible, but usually about one hour after you're done exercising, you're gonna start to see a huge improvement. And you're gonna look back at, you know, let, let's say you exercise from three to 3.30 and you, you felt horrible all day. At three o'clock you exercise, three to 3.30, you felt 10 times worse because you were exercising and then about 4.30, you know, you're going to say, okay, now I feel about what I did before. And by 5.30, you're going to say, you know what, I feel five, ten times better than I did back at two o'clock. All right. So, so all I want you to do is try this, um, you, you know, five days this week, 20 minutes, get that heart rate up. Um, and, and like I said, the benefits of it is going to far outweigh anything that you could ever purchase, any medication that you take. And uh, just go for it and can't wait to hear how it goes. So, so again, he, exercise is just going to be a huge part um, in helping you feel better and overcome a lot of these symptoms and things that you're dealing with. Um, so, so let's jump into the book and talk a little bit more about that. Um, so diet is also part of that. So number one, in your notebook is what you eat can directly affect your symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, so, you, you know, j just a few basics. Um, so salt can cause you to retain fluid and that increases nervous tensions, feelings of anxiety. Um, sugar depletes important vitamin B causing feelings of anxiety. So salt and sugar 
are two pretty big culprits in how you feel. Um, studies show one candy bar can cause some people to go into a panic attack. Again, it brings on those panicky feelings. And then back in session two, if you panic about those panicky feelings, it'll turn into a full-blown attack. Smoking and drinking can feed symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, so, you know, more and more always comes out on the negative effects of smoking. So, so hopefully as part of this 15 session program, if you are a smoker, set, set, set a goal, like you, you just don't need the smoking anymore. You're gonna have the skills that you need to, to help manage the emotions and the feelings and you don't need those negative health benefits of the smoking and, and same same thing with the alcohol so you know alcohol is a depressant and you know even though it may give you the quick stimulant right away um, it in the long run is just going to feed into your anxiety and depression as well and caffeine um, that'll trigger anxiety symptoms so, so i remember in one group um, we, we had somebody in our area, we have Sheets, which is kind of like a gas station convenience store. And I used to have what was called the Big Gulp. So, so I, I want to say it was maybe 128 ounces. I, I don't know. It was, it was a huge jug. It looked like it was about a gallon. And the, the one guy would always come to group and he had a Big Gulp with him every day. And, you know, basically shared every morning he goes to Sheets. And, you know, the big gulp, once you buy one, it was cheap to refill. And, and he filled it up with Mountain Dew every single day and drank a whole half gallon or w whatever this huge container was every single day. And, and for him, like he, he just slowly, you know, you, you don't want to actually, you know what, he did something a little different. Like I encouraged him, like, you, you know, j just slowly, you, you know, start doing three quarters of a big gulp and start doing half of a big gulp, then a quarter of a big gulp. Um, but he was like, you know, you know, if this is going to help, I just want to stop. And I said, you know, it was like, you're, you're going to hit a wall and, and, you know, you're definitely going to feel bad for a while, but eventually, and probably for the next two or three weeks when he quit, like he was not feeling good. He said, you know, I'm getting headaches. So I'm getting more symptoms. But, you, you know, I, I know you all are encouraging me. This is normal. I'm going to get through it. And really, like, probably around when week four rolled around, like, he was doing tremendous. And that caffeine intake was definitely, like, feeding into his anxiety and to his symptoms and feelings. And when he cut that out, that was huge. Um, so, so, you know, that caffeine increases the nervousness, irritability. You know, so if you're a three-cup-of-coffee morning drinker, Again, ju just try to cut down a little bit. You, you don't have to just completely cut everything out. But a lot of this is figuring out where exactly is your anxiety or depression stemming from and playing around with some of those players that it could possibly be from and, and see if it's making you feel a little better. And again, when you're breaking habits, some, sometimes you feel a little worse at the beginning, you know, until you develop a new habit, a healthier habit, and then you end up feeling so much better. So I, I will say like in my recovery, this, this was huge. So, so I, I remember like sugar was the big thing for me. I, I had a aunt that worked in a bakery and my mom would go and get me these little pretzel donuts, the glazed donuts shaped like a pretzel. And we would have my aunt put the donut icing on top of the glazed pretzel donut as well. And I would eat two of those every morning for breakfast. And, and I was a huge Kool-Aid drinker. So, so I, I was drinking Kool-Aid pretty much all day long. And my, my sugar intake was just off the charts. And when I started to cut back on how much sugar I was taking in and, and really got to the point where like I, I had sugar, but not really any sweets. So I wasn't eating cookies, cake, those sort of things. Like that was probably 70% of, of part of my recovery and being able to just cut down on those things and because that that sugar just kept feeding in to my anxiety symptoms and when I cut that down it, and cut that out it, it made such a tremendous difference. Um, so if, if you look in the middle there's a simple guide to vitamins and the foods that contain them. All right so, so, so here's the thing like let's say you, you know you're, you're feeling nervous you can see that first one vitamin b6 which is in fish and turkey can, can help with nervousness. Now, now here's the thing, if, if, if you go out and you just start eating fish and nothing else but fish, like it, it's not gonna take all your nervousness away. 
So all these things that are kind of in the middle, they show like they can have a little bit of a benefit. And, and so, you know, if you have the fatigue, if you have muscle cramps, grouchiness, insomnia, those sort of things, like you can look at the foods that may help that. But, you know, nobody's ever come in and said like, uh, I'm eating nothing but almonds now for magnesium. So my depression has been completely gone, <laughs> right? But they may say, hey, I started eating almonds as a snack and it seems to be helping me a little bit. So, so again, it's just a, a guide to some foods and things that may be able to help you uh, feel a little bit better in some of those areas. But you can see, you, you know, the, the most important statement there in the notebook uh, for this session with the diet says eating a healthy diet with low sugar, limited caffeine, rich in vitamins and minerals will always trump supplements and help you with your anxiety and depression, right? So you can do the multivitamins, you can do, you know, extra vitamin C, you can do, you know, whatever it is you take. But, I, you know, I, I can guarantee you that if you just eat healthy foods and you're eating the fruits and the vegetables and, and you know, staying away from a lot of the sweets, like that's going to do so much more for your anxiety, your depression, and your overall health than any supplement could ever do. All right. So number two is exercise. Again, that, that was what the skill was. And you saw a lot of this already in the video, but exercise can manage your anxiety and depression. Again, in, in the middle of it, you, you know, it may be the last thing you want to do while you're doing it. You may feel horrible, but again, about an hour afterwards, you'll start to feel the benefit and be so thankful that you did. They have tremendous long-term benefits. Again, supplements is 30 billion plus a year industry. And, and I guarantee if I could put in a bottle, all the benefits of exercise and sell it as a pill, like it, everybody would want it and buy it. Yet you don't need to buy it because it's free. And uh, so the benefits is your, it, it's shown, studies showed them, it makes you happier, less stressed, stronger, healthier, reduces your chance of disease, gives you good brain health, better sleep, and more focus. All right. And, and part of it, you just have to schedule it. And, you, you know, honestly, you, you know, because you're going to be feeling less sluggish, because you're going to be feeling better, doing, doing exercise 20 minutes a day is probably going to make you more productive the entire day. So, so you're really not losing 20 minutes, probably by spending that 20 minutes, you're going to gain an hour or two just because you have more energy, you can get more done and those sort of things. Um, so, so the big thing, you know, doing at least three to four days, you know, five would be ideal, 20 to 30 minutes, and, and you want to work yourself up. So it, if you've been sitting on the couch for the last three years, it, it, it may start with just walking around the block or walking around your house, those sort of things. Um, but, you, you know, you, you want to get up to the point where you can do 20 to 30 minutes of moderate exercise, you know, so, so swimming, um, you know, a, a brisk walk around the neighborhood. Um, and, and, you know, j just I, I'm into ball sports. So, so, you know, I love going with my son, you know, to play tennis. We throw the football around, we throw the baseball around, um, play basketball. We have a basketball hoop outside. Um, so, so, so it kind of makes exercise, at least for me, fun. And you know, the, the other thing I definitely suggest is to start making it a lifestyle. Um, so, you know, when you go to the store, don't park at the closest spot to the door. Um, I, I know at the college, you know, I, in my office, I have a bathroom that's pretty much right across the hall. When, when I need to use the restroom, I go upstairs, I go down the entire other end of the building. Um, just because it, it gets me up and moving. And that's the other thing with exercise, you know, studies have shown like it's better to like move around during the day, um, throughout the day than it is like sitting eight hours a day and then going to the gym for an hour and then going home and sitting on the couch. So, so, so it's almost like that hour is great, but you also need to be moving and getting your blood flowing and all those sort of things throughout the day as well. So hopefully the exercise makes sense to you. Uh, number three is sleep. I, I know this tends to be a huge issue for people with anxiety and depression, um, but number three, sleep can help you manage. Um, so some suggestions, you want to get on a routine. So, so trying to stick to a certain bedtime, waking up in a certain morning, you know, weekends come, don't sleep in an extra three hours and go to bed three hours late. Just try and get on a routine. Um, so, so the REM sleep, that is kind of like the deep sleep that everybody wants. So that tends to happen two to three hours into your sleep. So, so it's not good to nap throughout the day and then at night 
you know, sleep for an hour, wake up, sleep for an hour, because you lose out on all that healthy deep sleep. So, 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 you know, moving towards cutting out the napping and just sticking to that bedtime, going to the bed same time and waking up the same time, you know, use calming skills before bed. So don't watch the news, you know, don't check your social media, that kind of stuff, you know, ju ju just meditate, pray, you know, talk to your spouse. You know, one of the things that you want to get in a habit of doing is seeing, you know, your, your bed is mainly for sleep. So when the lights go out, your head hits the pillow, like that your body knows, okay, now it's time to sleep. So don't get anxious about not sleeping. Rest is beneficial, but you, you know, they, they say if you're up for more than 30 minutes, it's better to get up and go do your normal routine. So, you know, go, go into another room, go into some dim lighting, read a book, um, go rebrush your teeth, go get a little drink of water and do everything that you normally do before you go to sleep. And when you feel drowsy, go head back to bed and uh, definitely limit your screen time. So, so you, you know, just the, the lights from our phones and those sort of things can have an impact on us. Um, so you can see it impacts our heart, our mind, our weight, emotional balance, energy, it reduces disease, increased memory and focus. So, so sleep is another huge part in helping us to feel better and overcome some of these things. Now, again, what we're doing is called cognitive behavioral therapy. And uh, what, 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 there is like a field in this, it's called CBTI. So it's called cognitive behavioral therapy and the I stands for insomnia. So, so there's certain skills you can do out there to help you sleep. Um, I, I believe there's an app that's called CBTI coach that, that can kind of walk you through this. And because your brain's already starting to think in these better but believable thoughts and new patterns, you're at a point where that could be effective and, and helpful for you. You know, CBTI is for people already engaged in CBT, which now you are. And uh, so, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you a real short video that kind of talks about what that is and it gives some great suggestions and maybe some of you will find this helpful. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, or CBTI, focuses on changing both behaviors and thoughts. CBTI is a longer-lasting solution than medications, and studies show it helps most people who try it, even people who have had insomnia for years. Usually a sleep specialist or psychologist will guide you through this over a few weeks. So while I'll go over a few key strategies here, your doctor can refer you to someone who can help you with this in person. Okay, the first thing many sleep specialists will ask you to do is keep a sleep journal for at least two weeks. And there are many different types of these journals, but they usually track things like when you went to bed, what time you woke up in the morning, when you think you were asleep during the night, how many total hours you spent in bed, and how you felt in the daytime. You can just use paper and pen to do this. In fact, there's a printable sleep journal you can find at the end of this program. Or you can use wearable sleep technology, like those wristbands that track how much you sleep. Just know they're not always 100% accurate. All right, one of the main goals of CBTI is to make a strong connection between your bed and sleep. What do I mean by that? Well, when you lie in bed sleepless night after night, you begin to link your bed with being awake, when really your bed should be a cue for sleep. Now, a cue is something that not only reminds you, but practically pushes you into doing something. Think about walking into a movie theater and how the smell of popcorn makes you want to buy it. To turn your bed into a cue for sleep, use your bedroom only for sleep and sex. So that means... No laptops, phones, to-do lists, or TVs. Just take anything and everything not related to sleep outside your bedroom. If you usually lie there awake because you're making mental to-do lists or worrying, set aside 15 minutes earlier in the day to write down what's on your mind. You don't have to do anything about it, but by getting it down on paper, it's like you're giving yourself permission to power down and sleep later. On that note, I also want to bring up negative sleep thoughts. You know the ones. Uh, I'm never going to fall asleep. Or, there's no way I'm going to be able to function tomorrow. Having these thoughts spin around your head when you're trying to sleep only makes the problem worse. But a sleep specialist or therapist can help you deal with those. And you'll learn that many of these thoughts aren't even true. For example, most people find a night of bad sleep is not as disastrous as they tell themselves it'll be. 
Okay, another big goal of CBTI is to spend less time in bed. I know your instinct might tell you the opposite, but cutting down your time in bed will actually help you get a more solid block of sleep at night. So you'll spend less time in bed, not less time asleep. To help with that, here's an idea. If you've been lying awake for more than 30 minutes, get up and go to another room. And don't worry about it being exactly 30 minutes. Just get up if it feels like it's been a while. Then do something relaxing in very dim light until you're sleepy again. Another rule of thumb is to wake up at the same time every day. And yep, that even means weekends. I know catching up on sleep might seem like a good idea, but for people with insomnia, it really throws your schedule off. And another tip is, don't go to bed until you're sleepy. Not just tired, but sleepy. When your eyes are droopy and you feel like you could actually fall asleep. That might mean staying up a little later than you used to, but it'll actually give you deeper sleep. Along the same lines, it's best to avoid napping if you can, especially in the late afternoon or evening. That's because you want your sleep drive, the rubber band, to get nice and stretched out. Now, when you follow these healthy sleep behaviors, you might actually feel pretty tired for a few weeks. Try to think of that as a sign it's working. In time, you should have a regular sleep schedule, be sleeping more deeply, and wake up less often. All right, let's talk about sleep medications, which are sometimes used while people build new sleep. So hopefully you picked up a tip or two there if you struggle with insomnia and sleeping. And again, you know, trying to get on that routine can definitely help you with your anxiety or depression. So number four, you know, usually the older people in groups or that I work with, you know, pe people over the age of 50, like have no problem <laughs> with this one. You know, the younger ones, especially the, the 15 to 30 year olds, give a lot of pushback, but number four is use technolo uh, using technology to make an impact on your anxiety and depression. You know, so, so since the, you know, 2010, uh, when, you know, Facebook became popular, those sort of things, like the, the amount of anxiety, depression, suicides, like as the use of social media went up, so did all the mental health issues. Now, now I, I don't think that social media is the only thing that's played into that, that there's other factors as well. Uh, but, you know, there, there's definitely a correlation. And uh, so you can see studies already prove that social media impacts our happiness, our self-esteem, feelings of loneliness and empathy. Even just staring at our phone screens um, can impact our focus, memory and feelings. And, and you know, I, I believe you know, social media and electronic video games, those sort of thing, addictions are real, um, that, that people, if they don't use them, can, can really feel like almost like a withdrawal. And, and you know, their, their brain doesn't function the, the way it should. And, and you know, they, they get a lot of those withdrawal feelings. And uh, so, so, so what, what I will say, you, you know, again, a lot of these things you're just trying out. And I want you to try and say, you know, I'm going to cut down on staring at my phone all day. I'm going to cut down, you know, how much time I spend on my social media and just see how it makes you feel. And, you know, when people do that, I've had many stories of people who said it made them feel so much better to limit uh, some of these areas. All right. So, so for your homework this week, you're going to choose a three to five day period. Let's just go with five. <laughs> you, you know, I, I want you to jump all in here. Don't put your toe in the swimming pool, trying the waters out. Like let, let's jump in all out. And so, so I want you to pick a five day period uh, uh, between now and the next time when you, before you do session six and, and just focus on eating healthy, nutritious food. So cut out the sweets, cut down on the coffee, you know, you know instead of drinking soda, um, drink water, those sort of things. Um, schedule to exercise 30 minutes, at least 30 minutes on day one, three, and five. And again, for some of you, that may be going to the gym because you're in shape and you're used to this. Some of you may be getting up off the couch and walking around your house or around the block. Um, go to bed and get up at the same time all, all five days. 
you know, so, so set a bedtime, you know, set your alarm to wake up at a certain time, do a social media fast for at least three of those days and, and just set your phone aside and you know enjoy the extra time you have with your family connecting with an old friend um, and just enjoying nature whatever it may be keep targeting those negative thoughts and then there's some space in there for you to put in your notebook things that you notice hey you, you know what when when i only drank one cup of coffee rather than two it wasn't nearly as bad as i thought or you know by day three when I was getting going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, like my sleep was actually better. So, so, so just make some notes of where this is helping you and especially how it's impacting your anxiety and depression. And again, keep going after those negative thoughts, start those exercises, these skills that you're learning, keep using them and you're gonna get to whatever goal that you set and, and just can't wait to hear the story uh, of how much benefit um, and how you were able to overcome and recovery from all these symptoms that you've been facing. So see you next time.